Good morning, North Shore. Just so you know, we have started a little bit late on purpose, okay? <laughs> just to let everybody get here, and we'll probably have a few joining us as we come along. My name is Paul Enns, and I've been a friend of Jeremy and Liesel's for, for many years, and I'm privileged to be here this morning helping us worship together. So whether it's well-known carols, whether it's well-known worship songs, we pray that it will all be honoring and glorifying to God as we lift our voices together. So if you are able, will you join me and stand, and we will enter into worship. From the realms of glory, wing your flight o'er all the earth. Ye who sang creation's story, now proclaim Messiah's birth. Come and worship, come and worship, worship Christ the newborn King. desert, a highway for our God. As we worship today, let us prepare to welcome God's dramatic work in our midst, in our hearts, in our community, and in all of creation. Let us worship God. Jesus born to set thy people free from our fears and sins. Release us, let us find our rest in thee. Israel's strength.
rest in thee. And as we've received that rest, or at least the idea of that rest, the beginning of that rest coming, we praise our God. Praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in one, God of glory, majesty, praise forever to the King of Without hope and without light Till from heaven you came running There was mercy in your eyes To fulfill the law and prophets To a virgin came the word From the throne of endless glory To a cradle in the dirt Well, good morning, everyone. So today is the fourth Sunday of Advent, and as such, we get to light the fourth candle, the candle of love. To our beautiful, ever-growing decorations, 
as you may have noticed, uh, we've added the color red. And our scripture reading today is from John 3.16. For God loved the world in this way, that he gave his only son in order that everyone who believes in him will not die, but have everlasting life. There are gifts that cost something, and there are gifts that cost nothing at all. It doesn't cost anything to give your pocket change away, to give away used clothes that you don't need anymore, or to combine your spring cleaning with a trip to the charity shop. It doesn't cost much either to give someone a word of encouragement, a hug, or a smile. These are all low-cost gifts. But, as I'm sure you know, many gifts cost a lot. To give away something that's new rather than something that's used. To give away something that is precious to you rather than something you don't need anymore. We can even give our time and our attention. We can invest in people who have absolutely nothing to give us into, in return. These are the gifts that cost something. And at Christmas, we get to celebrate the greatest gift of all, that God, who had nothing whatsoever to gain from us, gave what was most valuable to him. That God gave the life and blood of his son Jesus so that we could have life with him. At Christmas, we remember that God gave the costliest gift of all, a gift that causes all of our generosity to reduce to nothingness. So may we remember, as we look to the red of our beautiful decorations, the gift that was given out of an incomparable love for us so that the world could have life. Morning, everyone. Morning. Let's settle our bodies and our hearts and pray. Holy Father, we give you all glory and honor and praise and worship. We delight, Lord, in the wonder of who you are. Lord, I woke up this morning and looked outside, and it was wonderful, this blanket of quiet snow. Lord, you're in the midst of everything. I'm excited. It's springtime, and I'm stunned to find I'm excited in the winter. You're in the middle of everything, Lord, and we give you praise. In your mercy, Lord. Hear our prayers. Father, we lift up North Shore Alliance Church and all the ministries that happen here. Lord, we thank you. Um, just, I'm grateful to be part of such a wonderful community of, of brothers and sisters, just drawn into the same place by your mercy and grace. We thank you for this church, Lord. We pray for your blessings over every person here, every ministry that operates, Lord, may the life that you give us just spill out into service for you in the name of Jesus Christ as we love on one another. We pray for the ministries of this church. In your mercy, Lord, hear our prayers. Father, there are many among us who are sick and heart sick. And so, in obedience, we lift them before your throne of glory, and we pray for them by name. Lord, I pray for Greg. Don't want to miss anyone. Lord, I pray for Mark and Christine, for Jim, for Fina, for Sarah, for Lucy, for Sarah, 
for Joan and Dale, for Elle, for Ken and June, for Linda, Bobby and Selina, Don and Anne, Saoirse, Susanna, Sonia and her family. And Lord, we all know someone who needs a special touch from you. And so in silence, we just lift their names to you now, Lord. Father, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Jesus, what a blessing it is to live in North Vancouver. Thank you for this city. Thank you for the city of Vancouver and the surrounds and the fact that you have placed us all in a particular time and place in this world. Lord, may we live out the truth of your love to all of those that we encounter. Father, we lift up this world that you have made. Help us to just live by the power of your Holy Spirit at work in us, to do our small part to make it a better place to be. Help us, Lord, we cannot do this in our own strength. We come before your throne and ask that you would fill us with a newness of life and purpose in the name of Jesus Christ. In your mercy, Lord, hear our prayers. And now, Lord, as we, um, as we hear your word today through Pastor Jeremy, would you bless him as he speaks to us, Lord? Would you um, give us ears to hear and tender hearts to respond. In your name we pray, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Preteens, let's go have some fun. <laughs> Thanks, Michelle. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, on Friday, I was in the office, and uh, I could hear, he's got thin walls, I could hear Dave through the wall next door, and he was praying, Lord, cause the snowstorm to go away for tomorrow's Christmas dinner. I noticed that he didn't pray for this morning, the same thing. So uh, he bumped it to today, and it's all right. Yesterday's Christmas dinner was fantastic. Those of you who were there, it was a great joy to be present and, and to see all these lovely people there and all the volunteers we had, um, and it was, a, it was a ton of fun. And so I'm, I'm really touched by our church <clears throat> and by the generosity of our church and the heart of service uh, that gets to show through on a night like yesterday, and that was a lot of fun. So if you missed it, sign up next year. If you were there, thanks for being there. Uh, it was a great time to be there for us all. Uh, if you missed, uh, last week I wasn't here. I was at a funeral in Chicago, um, and I'm glad to be back with you this week as well. Uh, just a couple things to say before we get started. Um, you all know that next week is Christmas and Christmas Eve. We've got our three services, Christmas Eve. Uh, and since all of you will be here that night, we will have no in-person services next Sunday morning. So we'll have only a live stream service next Sunday morning, so you can stay in your pajamas and watch a video. That's our gift to you uh, next, next week. Uh, the Sunday after that is New Year's Day, and we will have one 10 a.m. service that day. All right? So a few odds and ends. All these things will go out in the e-bulletin. You'll see them. Shouldn't be any surprises. Uh, but <clears throat> sometimes if I say it, people hear it, um, and that's good. So next week, nobody's going to be here, okay? Not in this room anyway. We'll be home. It's great. <clears throat> well, hey, it's the um, fourth Sunday of Advent, as you know. Uh, here we are. We've lit these four candles. Each week we've had a reading. We've been focusing on what's going on uh, in the season, just paying attention to uh, building up to this season of receiving Christ again. And our kind of theme through the season has been the good news of the gospel, that Christ's coming is really good news. Uh, one of the reasons that I had invited my Uncle Herman to come and preach to us was that he's an evangelist and he loves the gospel. And I wanted us to foreground the good news of Jesus those weeks. Uh, and Dave, last week, got to talk about the good news of the incarnation and creation and what this means for us. And today, we're going to talk about uh, Mary's song, When She Heard the Good News for the First Time, um, what's called the Magnificat. We're going to read this passage in Luke and talk about it together. 
Um, it's the song she sings when she learns she's going to have Jesus. And the question that kind of gets us into this, the question that I'm going to circle around and come back to is this, which is what kind of person do you need to be for the gospel to be good news for you? I think that's a tough question, actually. What kind of person do you need to be for the good news of the gospel to be good news for you? And so I want us to dig into this this morning. I'm going to read a somewhat long passage, Luke 1, uh, 26 through 56, which has got some familiar words, but I'm going to focus on the song of Mary that's at the end. So uh, let me read this for you now. Luke writes this. Now, in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the descendants of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And coming in, he said to her, greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was very perplexed at this statement and kept pondering what kind of salutation this was. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I am a virgin? The angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you, and for that reason the Holy Child shall be called the Son of God. And behold, even your relative Elizabeth has also conceived a son in her old age, and she who was called barren is now in her sixth month, for nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, the bond slave of the Lord, may it be done to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Now at this time, Mary arose and went in a hurry to the hill country, to a city of Judah, and entered the house of Zacharias and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leapt in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And she cried out with a loud voice and said, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And how has it happened to me that the mother of my Lord would come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby leapt in my womb for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be fulfillment of what had been spoken to her by the Lord. And Mary said, or rather Mary sang, My soul exalts the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior. For he has regard, had regard for the humble state of his bond slave. For behold, from this time on, all generations will count me blessed. For the mighty one has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is upon generation after generation toward those who fear him. He has done mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who were proud in the thoughts of their heart. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, and he has exalted those who were humble. He has filled the hungry with good things. He has sent away the rich empty-handed. He has given help to Israel, his servant, in remembrance of his mercy, as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and his descendants forever. And Mary stayed with her about three months and then returned to her home. Now, these are probably somewhat familiar Christmas words to you. You've probably read them a bunch of times. And I'd like us to think about Mary as a person for just a couple minutes. Um, To be a young, engaged-to-be-married girl in the Middle East probably means that Mary is about 16 years old at this time, okay? Probably about that age. She meets this angel who tells her she's going to become pregnant. Now, Mary lives in a barnyard culture. She knows how people become pregnant. She's not ignorant of these things, so she can ask the question, how will this be since I am a virgin? She knows. She's She's not ignorant of these And when she finds out that she's going to be pregnant, she responds with remarkable faith. Verse 38, may it be to me according to your word. May it happen to me, what you said. That's a pretty remarkable thing to say. And then she's unmarried and pregnant and visits her cousin Elizabeth, who's also miraculously pregnant in her old age, right? She's going to give birth to John the Baptist. Now, teen pregnancy out of wedlock is rarely received as good news. But Mary receives this as very good news. And not just good news, sing songs about it, good news. When was the last time you sang a song because you heard good news? I bet I can guess it what was for most of you. Most of you finished your last semester of school, right? And you walked out of the school door and you found the song and plugged in the radio, Alice Cooper's School's Out for Summer. (laughs) School's out forever, right? And you danced and sang because school was out. That's probably the only time you've done that, right? 
But you've all seen it also. You guys watched the 1983 movie Return of the Jedi, right? And at the end, after the Emperor's been destroyed, remember the little Ewoks on the ground? What do they do? They sing a song, right? And they dance and they kind of bop because it's a little guy in a costume, right? And they sing, yub dub, each up, yub dub, right? And they go for their song. Some of you are going to hear that in your head for the rest of the day. And I hope, I hope I've planted that successfully for you. When was the last time you heard such good news that you just broke out into song like Mary does here? Such good news that she sang. And there's something profound about that. So why does she sing? What's the good news that she heard? And the answer we may find, we find may surprise you in some ways. So why is this good news is the question we want to ask. There's two big reasons, two kind of big reasons why this is good news. The first one, if you're following in the notes, is this. It's good news simply because Mary believed. It's good news because she believed. Look again at her words in verse 38. Mary said, Behold the bond slave of the Lord. May it be done to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. May it be done to me according to your word. She receives it with faith. Uh, when Zechariah earlier in this says, he, he, he kind of talks back to Gabriel. And Gabriel says, Because you didn't believe me, you're not going to say anything until this baby comes, right? And there's a contrast between Zechariah, who's this old priest who doesn't get it right, and Mary, who's this innocent young girl who does get it right. And she receives it with faith. It's quite beautiful. Uh, Elizabeth echoes this at verse 45, uh, Luke 1, 45. Blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what had been spoken to her by the Lord. She heard the word and she believed it. And it is remarkable that she believed because Mary, in believing, becomes the model for all Christian faith. Think about it this way. Mary was the first person to have Christ in her. (laughs) She believed, and Christ took up residence within her. And we believe, and Christ takes up residence within us. Mary is the first. And her belief is something really profound for us. And she believes on the testimony of the angel. She believes the word, and now the word of God grows in her womb. And she believed that because of this, something profound and important was going to happen in her and through her that was going to transform the whole world, okay? This is good news. And so good news begins for us, as with Mary, when we believe the word that God has spoken. Good news begins when we believe. The second thing it is, is this, it's good news, secondly, because of who God is. It's good news because she believed, but it's also good news because of who God is. And this brings us to the song, Mary's Magnificat, which is what the song is often called. And the content of that song is God's character, how he has done some amazing things. Interestingly, in writing it, she draws from the Psalms. Specifically, she reworks Psalms 103 and Psalm 107. Uh, There's a couple direct quotes. I won't go into these at the moment, but Luke 150 is a quote from Psalm 103.17. You've got these in your notes. And 153 is a quote from Psalm 107.9. So Mary's consciously uh, reworking some psalms in this. And there are some really strong languages, echoes between her opening of it and Psalm 103. And in fact, let's take a closer look at these two psalms. I'm just going to read the first nine verses of Psalm 103. (coughs) Excuse me. So this is the psalmist saying this, Praise the Lord, O my soul, all my inmost being, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion, who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all the oppressed, He's made his way known to Moses, his deeds to the people of Israel. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. So the opening of Mary's song, My Soul Magnifies the Lord, echoes the opening of Psalm 103, Praise the Lord, O My Soul. There's a clear kind of draw where she's got a kind of psalmic memory which she's working with. And by evoking these words, by evoking the conscious memory of Psalm 103, Mary is saying that the God who does these things listed in Psalm 103, the God who forgives and heals and redeems and crowns and satisfies and works righteousness for the oppressed, is doing it for us. And that's good news. This God is in play right now, okay? Now, she does a similar thing with Psalm 107. 
So let's look at Psalm 107, and we'll see some similar characteristics of God. Here the psalmist says this, oh, Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his loving kindness is everlasting. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he has redeemed from the hands of the adversary, gathered from the lands, from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. They wandered in the wilderness in a desert region. They did not find a way to an inhabited city. They were hungry and thirsty. Their soul fainted within them. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble. He delivered them from their distress. He led them also by a straight way to go to an inhabited city. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his loving kindness and for his wonders to the sons of men. For he has satisfied the thirsty soul and the hungry soul he has filled with what is good. So Mary also evokes this psalm, and by evoking Psalm 107, she expands on the list of things that God is doing for his people. Here he goes on. He's redeeming them from their adversaries. He's gathering them from their exile into homes. He's satisfying the hungry and thirsty. He's delivering all who called him from their distresses and from their oppressions. And therefore, Mary is saying that the God who does this is also doing it for us now. And that's also really good news. It's the second reason for good news. Now, we're going to think a little bit more about Mary for a moment, but let's think about her as an author. I mean, if she is, in fact, a 16-year-old girl, she is so familiar with God's Word that she can rework it at will. When you stub your toe, what comes out? <laughs> do, the, do the Psalms come out? Okay. What is it that comes out? Isn't that interesting? How many 16-year-olds do you know who have such a comprehensive knowledge of the Bible that they can rework it into poetry at will? That's kind of convicting, isn't it, about these things? It makes Mary a profound theologian in her own way. Are you reading enough of God's Word so that it's at hand? It's in your consciousness. It's under your breath. It's where, where you need it, when you need it. Are you in God's Word in that way like Mary is? Let her be a model for our faith. She's a good teacher in this. Do your 16-year-old children know enough of God's word to create psalms on demand? Probably not. Their heads are probably filled with Marvel comic quotes and Taylor Swift lyrics. They're not able to do this. So what are we doing? This is just a conviction, I think, that we have to deal with as people. Mary's psalm has this very psalmic quality, and I want you to be able to hear part of it. And actually, I've, um, I've retranslated it for you this morning. It's up on the screen and let me read it again, and I wanted to highlight the, her, the sense of repetition that she has, and I want you to hear that there's something lovely and kind of biblically poetic about what she does. So here's what she writes. Magnify the Lord, O my soul. Rejoice, O my spirit, in God my Savior, because he regards the humility of his servant girl. For behold, from now on all generations will bless me, because he has done for me great things, the mighty one and his holy name and his mercy to generations and generations of those who fear him. Power works through his arm. He scatters the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He removes rulers from thrones. He exalts the humble. The hungry he fills with good. The wealthy he dismisses empty. He is helping his child Israel, remembering mercy, just as he said to our fathers, to Abraham and his seed for eternity. This is a pretty powerful bit of theology, especially for a young girl in a Middle Eastern culture 2,000 years ago. Powerful stuff coming out of her. Some brief comments about her little Mary psalm here. The first part, the first section, uh, paragraph, Mary is exalting the Lord for who he is. This is the Psalm 103 section. The second half, verses 51 to 56, Mary exalts the Lord for the things he does. This is the Psalm 107 section. If you get a chance later, I encourage you to go and read Psalm 107. There's a series of things happen. Uh, people get into situations of trouble, and they cry out to the Lord, and you know what he does? He rescues them. Okay? They're in prison. They cry out to the Lord. He rescues them. They're lost. They cry out to the Lord. He rescues them. They're in need. They cry out to the Lord. He rescues them. It's a wonderful psalm of promise about how God meets people in their needs, that need people, people who are powerless, and so what is the good news that makes Mary sing? It's the good news that the God who does these things, the God who has delayed, but the God who has promised, the God of compassion from Psalm 103 who answers human need, and the God of Psalm 107 who answers our distresses, he is doing these things. And what is more, the God who does these things, who is doing this good work right now in the person of Mary. 
And because of that, everybody from now on will be affected by what God is doing in her. And so she sings about it. And that's good news. So here, let's come to the next question, which is, is this good news for you? What kind of person do you need to be to receive Mary's song as good news? Is the gospel, in fact, good news for us? Let's look at for a moment at some of the characteristics of the person who hears this as good news. Um, because God scatters the proud, it's good news for people who aren't proud, right? Because God reduces rulers, it's good news for people who aren't in positions of authority. Hmm? Because it's for the humble, it's, um, again, not for people who are puffed up. Because it's good news for the hungry, it's not very good news for people who are full right now. Because God sends the rich away empty-handed, guess what? It's not great news for the rich. Because it's people waiting for God's mercy, it's not people who feel like they've got it all sorted at the moment. Is that you? Now, when I read Mary's song, I find it bears a striking resemblance to Jesus' fourth beatitude. Matthew chapter 5, verse 6, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Not blessed are those who are rich now. Not blessed are those who sit in power now. Not blessed are those who are content now. Not blessed are those who are proud and self-sufficient now. And the gospel, in other words, is not for people who are content with the status quo. And if we're at peace with the status quo, we will find ourselves at odds with the gospel, at least according to Mary's song. So the rich, the proud, the rulers, they're people who have adapted themselves and their ethics to the status quo. They want to preserve and keep their power. They've found their place in the world, or maybe the world has found its place in them, and they have a vested interest in preserving and keeping their positions of power and holding onto their territory and keeping what they have. And to such people, the coming of King Jesus is objectively a threat. He's about to remove all structures of power. He's about to remove and blow the walls out of what we think wealth means. He's wealth changing. He changes power dynamics. And to any person who has accommodated their life to the status quo, the coming of King Jesus will be profoundly disturbing. Here's a key takeaway. The good news of the gospel is bad news to people who like the status quo. The good news of the gospel is bad news to people who like the status quo. Do you have power now? Guess what? King Jesus is coming to take it. Do you have wealth now? Guess what? King Jesus is coming to redistribute it. Okay? Are you self-satisfied now? Guess what? Jesus is going to leave you uncomfortable. What this means ultimately is that the good news is for the needy, for people who have positioned themselves as people who need God, people unhappy with the status quo. Echoing Psalm 107, it's for people who cry to the Lord in their need, not to people who can trust in their power, their fullness, their self-sufficiency. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, those who choose to suffer for what is right, those who refuse to compromise with what is wrong in the world. Blessed is the man, woman, and child who willingly embraces neediness for the sake of God's justice. This brings us to the justice of God, and that, in fact, is part of the background of this whole song, because Mary's song is a song about justice, about the coming of justice to the world. And you may not have thought of this before, but Advent is a season of justice, we think of Advent as kind of nice and... We've got a strong Victorian image of Advent, right? Even our Christmas trees are Victorian, right? Everything comes from that kind of era, and all of our Christmas carols are from the Victorian era, and all of our Christmas traditions are from the Victorian... We're, we like the Victorians. We don't want to admit it. And um, it's, that's all of our motives. But you know what? The Christmas message is a message of a changing of the new world order. It's the coming of God's justice into the world. Christ, the coming king of justice. And if the justice of Mary's song doesn't sound like good news, that means there's probably something in us that needs readjustment. We're the ones who have to change. I want to take a few moments to talk about the justice of God. Three very basic points about God's justice. There's a lot more I could say, but these are the three things I wanted to say this morning. First of them is this. Uh, God's, the justice of God is coming. The justice of God is coming. Well, uh, Don, us a few slides forward for us here. Uh, God himself is just. He simply cannot be otherwise. He can't be other than perfectly just. And the return of Christ and the unveiling of his judgment is inevitable. 
Um, I like this phrase from Martin Luther King Jr. It says that we shall overcome because the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. Maybe you've heard that phrase before, but it's an elegantly put. The arc of the moral universe is long, but you know where it lands? Justice. It's inevitable. We may not be there yet, but we're going to be there. Uh, there's, there's no compromise on God's justice coming. And don't think that because the return of Christ is delayed that his justice isn't coming. It's coming. We're moving toward it. And on that day, every nation, every tribe, every tongue, every people, every person will come to terms with God's perfect justice. Second thing to say about justice is that the justice of God is perfect. It's perfect. Now, there's a lot of different ways to use the word perfect, but what I mean right now is that there will be no mistakes in God's justice. Um, Errors in justice are a human problem. You know, we jump to conclusions. You ever jump to conclusions about somebody? Yes. Right? You made a judgment. You fig- I figured this out. I know you've been, so, I'm sorry, I won't look at anybody in particular right now. Some of you this morning with your spouse jumped to conclusions with that person. You made a judgment. You're late because, right, you never do these things and something else is going on. I, I won't look at anybody. I know it happened. All right. So we judge based on partial information. We often condemn the wrong person, right? The criminal justice system, every once in a while, not every once in a while, every week you get some news story about a person who spent 25 years in prison for a crime they didn't commit, a miscarriage of justice, because we are not perfect in these ways, okay? Our justice is rarely fair. It's reactionary and violent. We overdo it, right? We want to get even. We don't want to be things to be right in the world. But God's justice is grounded in his perfect Knowledge. He never jumps to conclusions. He never makes the wrong judgment. He never makes mistakes in judgment. There are no false condemnations with God. God never says, oops, I got it wrong about you. His justice is perfect. It's never reaction. It's always perfectly measured. It's exactly right all the time. And at the end of time, when justice has been distributed once and for all, we will all of us say, in agreement with God, you are right. You're right. This is right. It'll be a hard moment for some of us. Third, the justice of God will be complete. And what I mean is that when God's justice comes, there will be no loose ends. He's not going to neglect anything. He's not going to leave anything aside. There's no bribery, no double ways. There's no, like, kind of back doors to justice to slip around it. Our justice is always going to be provisional. It's always going to be temporary. It's always going to be partial. His is going to be permanent, complete, and perfect in absolutely every way. And that's what I mean by it being complete. So when Jesus returns and God's perfect justice is revealed, uh, one way to consider the event is if uh, perhaps to say this, God's uh, justice reveals what's perfectly true and right. And when he reveals the true, we will realize just how crooked we all are. And the realignment will be us adjusting to his truth, not him accommodating his justice to our brokenness. And for some of us, for all of us, there will be some backbreaking involved. It will be painful. And so I have to ask again, is the gospel good news for you? Are you able to hear Mary's song, the song about justice, and enter into it with celebration? Yes, the justice of God is coming. Or does it place us maybe on the wrong side of the coming justice? I think that's hard. So let me give you some hope here. Let's talk about getting our hearts right. How do we figure this out? It's popular today, I don't know if you've heard this phrase, about being on the right side of history. Have you heard that phrase? Well, they're on the right side of history. Usually it means that um, I think that in the future you will regret your position, right? Because I'm on the right side of history and you're not. (laughs) There's a bit of pride in how people deploy it in these kind of ways. Uh, But you know what? Humans are positively terrible at judging what's right and wrong, especially what's right and wrong culture-wide. We're so enmeshed in our culture, we can't see how it violates God's kingdom. Short list, we are too tied up in our capitalist, oil-dependent, consumerist, self-fulfillment culture to see how our entrenched belief in personal choice might make us enemies of God. We're bad judges of these things. 
So how do we prepare ourselves now to be a people ready to receive God's justice? What can we do now to get on the right side of history? And here's the danger. I could give you a list of things, my kind of personal pet things. Well, I, I hate this aspect of culture. I want you to do this. I don't like this thing. I want you to... I could give you a whole list, and it's just my projected, uh, my projected sense of justice on you. I want us to have hearts that are right before God. I don't want you just to agree with me. They're not the same thing. So what does it look like? Actually, I want to point you to something written by um, an English mystic named Dame Julian of Norwich. Uh, she's one of my favorite theologians. She was a 14th century nun, and she was an anchoress. Really weird. They have like a funeral for her, and then they lock her up, and then she's alive, but <coughs> in her like prison cell, well, death room, <laughs> and then she just lives there. Uh, and people come and visit her. She's really, she's quirky, and she's weird, and she's delightful. It's fun to read her stuff. And here's one of the things that she says. After she has a near-death experience, she prays this prayer. Through the grace of God and the teaching of Holy Church, I developed a strong desire to receive three wounds, namely the wound of true contrition, the wound of genuine compassion, and the wound of sincere longing for God. And I want to take a moment and think about these three wounds that she talked about, compassion, contrition, and longing, because I think they shape and temper our justice in some powerful ways, and she gives us a way forward. I also think they give us a way to be more just, because justice without compassion and justice without contrition and justice without the longing of God always goes wrong. So let's talk about these three for a moment, and here's where we're landing in a moment. So the first wound is contrition. I'll highlight the word on the screen here for you. Contrition is sorrow for our sins. Contrition is a sense of feeling a, a grief over the fact that we ourselves have violated God's law. And a wound of contrition is a deeply sensed feeling of, I am not right with God, and I need to get right with him. Uh, and I think there's something really lovely about this. And justice recognizes always that we ourselves are people deserving of judgment. You thought about that? A true look at justice realizes, oh, actually, I, I need to get right. And justice goes wrong when we think that we are right. No, I, I need to be right. And that means to do that well, we have to have a heart that says, oh, God, help me to be right with you. In every way, in everything, in every relationship, a heart of contrition. And I wish this for all of us. The scriptures teach us that if we heed the word of God, if we repent and seek to change our ways, God will restore, renew, and save us. I want to remind you also that in the Sermon on the Mount, remember um, when you're, Jesus gives some advice on judging people. He says, you go to your neighbor, he says, don't remove the log from his eye or the speck from your neighbor's eye before dealing with the log in your own eye, Right? Now, he's not saying don't correct things in people because having a piece of sawdust in your eye is pretty awful. It just means don't be an idiot while you do it, right? And then it means that once you've done the self-reflective work of saying, how have I violated God's law, you're going to be a lot more tender and a lot kinder. And you'll come alongside the person and say, hey, I've had to deal with this. Can we talk about this together? Contrition precedes any, passing of, any, any communication about the justice of God with a fellow Christian. A heart of contrition. Make me soft before you, God, so that my judgments will always be kind. Okay. So, the wound of contrition. Second wound she talks about is the wound of compassion. Compassion is this feeling of love for one another, this deep sense of, of, of appeal and openness to other people. And justice without compassion always goes wrong. Always. Many of the people who claim to love justice really just are angry. What they love is getting their way. And they want things to be fair. How many of you have siblings and you, you fought about things being fair? And now you've projected this onto a personality that talks about justice with other people. No, everything has to be exactly the same. You had to do the thing where one person got to cut the cake and the other person got to choose the piece because you didn't trust anyone in your life, okay? And now you're fighting for this justice. They want their portion. They hate when someone has more than them. But as God's people, we are never allowed to seek justice without compassion. Compassion has to be the temper, the flavor, and even our motive for justice, that we have a deep sense of love for people who are lost. 
We are all, each and one, every one of us, people who deserve judgment, but we've received because of Christ mercy. We received the compassion of Christ, and therefore we've been given, um, f- um, given relief from our judgments. And therefore our love for God's justice must always be flavored by our visible and heartfelt compassion. I think this is one of the things that has been a major failure of Christian faith in, <laughs> throughout history, is that we have known the truth and we've spoken it, but without compassion. And it's fallen on deaf ears because we didn't have love. And so may we have the wound of compassion within us too. And the third wound that Julian mentions is the, a genuine longing for God. The longing for God, the eager desire for his kingdom and his ways, the desire to order the loves of our lives, to have our loves so orientated that the kingdom of God is first in his glory and his good and that our things become secondary relative to those. And so we pray, God, order our love so that we love your kingdom, first of all. And justice, if it's going to be just, must come from and be orientated toward the kingdom of God. Otherwise, it will always go wrong, not toward our world, not orientated toward getting our way and our rights, not toward our idea of punishing the wicked. Sometimes we just want to see people get their comeuppance, right? But that's not what it's about. And if we would begin to be just people on the earth in this life, then the primary place to change our thinking about what is and isn't justice is to love God. You see, I don't want to tell you things that I hate and say you should hate these things too. I want you to love God first and let him order your hearts for justice. It's got to come from the love of God. Otherwise, it will go wrong. It's not me loving my wealth, not me loving my rights, not me loving my freedom, not me loving my dreams, not me loving my potential. No. Love of God first. In Jesus' words, you know this well, Matthew 6, 33, seek first the kingdom of God and its righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Interesting thing about that word righteousness in Greek, it's the same word for justice. So we could actually translate this first, seek first the kingdom of God and its justice and all these things will be added unto you. Have your life and heart orientated according to the kingdom of God. So how do we get on the right side of history? Maybe you've wondered this, and I've got three answers for you today. One, repent. Have a heart of repentance before God. I'm not gonna get it all right. But I know that he does, and so I'm gonna trust in him. Two, love one another deeply. Let love be the motivating factor in all that you do. And three, set your heart on the kingdom of God. Love the kingdom. And that's the steps that will begin to get you on the right side of history. No cultural thing will get you there. Only God's kingdom can get you there. Uh, In a minute, we're going to have a time of responsive worship. In fact, I'll invite our musicians to come back up. And I want to invite you just for a moment to sit with these three wounds. Contrition compassion, and the longing for God. I want all three. Like Julian, I want all three of them. Uh, But maybe there's one of these today that you hear and you think, you know what, that's the one I want to sit with. And I want to invite you just right now, if you'll just take your hands and open them in front of you and quiet your hearts. And if you see one of these three words, if the word contrition, compassion, or longing for God, if one of those three resonates most strongly with you, I invite you to pray right now for that wound. A wound, a mark, a sense of, a sense of God's uh, deep presence within you in these things. So Heavenly Father, I pray for our brothers and sisters this morning here. And I pray that the only way to be on, I know the only way to be on the right side of history is to be your people and to be formed into your image. But on the way, Lord, teach us. If there are some who need contrition, would you teach us contrition? And if there are some who especially need compassion, would you call us to compassion? And if there are some who want a fresh longing for you in your kingdom, would you plant in us that longing? And I pray now, Lord, as we sing, that you would lead us into a deeper sense of your presence in these places. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Would you please stand, and we will worship together.
thirsty And all who are weak Come to the fountain Dip your heart in the streams of life Let the pain and the sorrow Be washed away waves of his mercy as deep cries out to deep we sing is a carol that deals with the justice of God well, I think, particularly in the second verse. Uh, it's O Holy Night. It's one that we don't always get to sing as a congregation very well. Um, but I encourage you to sing it out, take some deep breaths, <laughs> and go for it um, as we sing these incredible words and as we submit ourselves once again to the Lordship of Christ. together. Oh, holy night, the stars are brightly shining. It is the night of our dear Savior's birth. You sound wonderful. Long lay the world in sin and error power. And the soul felt its worth The thrill of hope The weary world rejoices For yonder breaks A new and glorious
let me pray for you all. Lord Jesus Christ, we glorify you that you came as a child in weakness to overturn power. Make us every day the kind of people we need to be to rejoice at your coming. In the name of Jesus, I pray this morning. Amen. Would you please take a seat? Hand things over to the illustrious Dave Sattler. I'll take that. I'm like the extra time substitute who comes in to finish off the game today. We'll call me that. Thank you, everybody, for being here today. My name is Dave, and I'm one of the pastors here at North Shore Alliance Church. Thanks for coming to church today and making it here. Thank you for those who join us today online. It's great to have you with us, too. We do have prayer available after the service. Uh, who's our prayer team? Dan and Andrea Hevener. They'll just be here after the service. If you like prayer for anything and everything, they would love to pray with you and pray for you. So Dan and Andrea will be here at the front. Just a few things to let you know about. First of all, uh, this next week is our last week of our church office being open, and we want to thank you for your generous giving through all of our uh, ups and downs of 2022. Thank you for giving to our general fund, our missions fund, our care fund. And I just wanted to let you know that we do have some needs, particularly in our missions fund and our care fund. I don't know if you heard about the news even this past week in Lonsdale, a big fire, 70 people, some connected to our church and to Coffee Time particularly now have lost their housing. So there's some opportunities for our church to step in to help some people. So just want to encourage you, Care Fund, General Fund, Missions Fund. We, uh, if your year-end giving is dated before December 31st, if you want to bring it into the church office, it needs to be here by this coming Friday, which is December the 23rd. And thank you for your generous giving. Also just wanted to let you know, uh, Dr. Rios already stole my thunder here. He already basically gave my announcement earlier that I was supposed to give about the services coming up over the next few days. So I'll go over it again here. December 24th, 4 and 5.30 are the family services. There'll be a camel. You won't want to miss that. Her. You won't want to miss her, the camel. Yes, well, there's a real person playing the part of a camel. It'll be great. And then there's, there's a 7 o'clock service. I'm leading that one. It won't be any fun at all. So the 7 o'clock service, I'll be part of No Fun Dave. So if you want to come to the 7 o'clock service, that'll be great. So that's December 24th. December 25th is a Sunday, one week from today, in case you didn't quite figure out the days these days. There will be no in-person service, but the service has been recorded, I believe, and it will be watchable from 9 a.m. on Christmas Day. So you could spend Christmas Day watching it at home. January the 1st is also a Sunday, and there will be a 10 a.m. one person, only one service in person, and then it, that will also be the service that will be live streamed and recorded, the 10 a.m. service on January the 1st. If you have any questions about that, you can chat with me in the foyer afterwards. Let's have coffee together. Dan and Andrea will be here to pray with you or pray for you. Thanks for coming today.